Long ago and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. I, uh, um, I grew up uh, around my grandparents, both, both my dad's parents and my mom's parents. My mom's parents lived on a, a farm up in rural northern Ohio, kind of in the Mansfield area. And we used to go up there for the summer. And, and what I've discovered about my grandparents is that my understanding of their story basically began when I entered the picture. Right? Like the, the, the way I, I remember them and, and thought about them was only the scope and the part that I participated in. And when my grandma um, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and, and began to deteriorate, and the family made the decision that it was time to move my grandparents off the farm, which was a difficult decision. I spent, my mom was, was born there, I spent the entire life growing up on that farm. It was special to all of us you start the process of sort of combing through all of their belongings. They were moving into a small assisted living apartment and so they just couldn't take the vast majority of the stuff. And some of those, some of those things were their memories. Um, boxes of photos and letters that they had written to each other. And that is my grandma dining room, Grace Crunkleton, okay. And my grandpa Brick Dininger, his name is Eldon, but nobody ever called him that because when he was a small child, he would constantly fall and hit his head, but never seem to get hurt. And so they called him Brick. Um, and that's all anyone ever knew him as was Brick Dininger. And I started to see images like this, like from their wedding day where they were celebrating um, their marriage and their commitment to each other. And, and you began to see, you began to gain this fuller story of who they were. The, the, their love story, the, the, I saw pictures of my mom when she was just a little girl, and it was like, mom was a little girl at one point in time? Like, all of these things begin to fill in the gaps of, of what you've missed. And I was thinking about this week because I think that this is, is one of the values and one of the purposes and and why we go back into the Old Testament, because I have a tendency to think of my faith this way. I have a tendency to think of the story of faith from the point that I entered the picture, um, or at least from the point of when I pick it up in, in Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, and you see Jesus on the scene and everything's unfolding, and yet you realize there's all of this that unfolds prior to that, that's leading in this redemptive story that God is telling and that we get to enter into. And we see this fuller, more in-depth picture of who Jesus is and what he's accomplished on, on our behalf. As you know, over the last few weeks, we've been looking together at some of, of the Old Testament prophets. These people who are living in an incredibly difficult time in the history of Israel who've been sent by God to represent or to speak on God's behalf to the people of Israel and oftentimes a very difficult message. We've been looking at how these prophets understood and talked about and pointed forward to the hope of a Messiah, to the hope of Jesus, to the arrival of a rescuer. They looked forward to who he would be, and in doing so, as we go back and we get this fuller sense of the story, it informs for us not only who Jesus is, it increases our understanding, but also then how we can relate to him. To communicate this, this message, the, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but the prophets would often use a variety of different metaphors. Um, if you can remember uh, when we first started the series, we looked at Micah, and Micah used this imagery of the, of the Messiah coming as the returning king, how he is coming to restore order and justice in this world of brokenness. He's going to come back into that place, and he is going to be their, their rescuer, their returning king. But that returning king is also going to be this shepherd. He's, he's collecting the people to himself. There's this authority of his reign, but also then this just caring provision and protection of the shepherd. Hosea talked about the coming Messiah as one who would be the true bridegroom. 
The, the one whose love for his people was a pursuing love and a redeeming love. The one who would be faithful even when we are unfaithful. Last week, Zechariah. Zechariah pictures this courtroom scene where we stand there as the accused, and, and, and rightly so, and there is an accuser who's pointing out our guilt and, and our faults, and, and yet Jesus then entered the scenes as our defender and our protector, and, and he's not only our advocate, but also it says that he clothes us, he wraps us around in his perfection and points to us and says, but they're innocent because of what I've done for them. It's this incredibly powerful scene, and all of this is helping Israel. It's informing Israel's hope, what it is that they hope for. And for us, it informs and ultimately helps us understand who Jesus is and how we can relate to him. The prophet Isaiah that we're going to look at today, he, similarly to Micah, he sort of depicts this in in the context of, of government, of reign, and authority in his rule and his justice as he proclaims the hope of the coming Messiah. We're going to turn this morning to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. This is uh, a familiar passage um, to many of us, and we'll get into that in just a minute. Beginning in verse 1, he says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the, pla- in the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. And the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor and every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, at Christmas time during Advent, we spent four weeks together focused on this same passage really actually focusing on those, those titles that Isaiah ascribes to who Messiah will be, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. But this morning, what I'd like to do is I would like to just sort of zoom out a bit to get this fuller picture that Isaiah is speaking into the people of Israel as he informs their hope. And this hope begins with the dawning of a new light. A new light has dawned. We, we collectively right now are in the process of like waking from our hibernation, right? Like we have spent the last few months living in our own experience of deep darkness. And, and if you saw just in the last couple of days when there's been sunlight, like we're all walking around kind of squinting because we haven't seen it in a long time but also with just this overwhelming sense of like life has meaning again, right? There's all sorts of studies and research about the impact of sunlight in us. I I, um, was looking for some examples of this and I found up in Barrow, Alaska. So Barrow, and they've actually changed their name back to the Inuit name um, that they originally had many, many years ago. But, and, and this part of Alaska, it's in the further uh, northernmost part of Alaska. So this is the most northern part of, of the United States. They experienced 67 straight days of night. Like 67 straight days without sunrise. Now at least like we get the general sense that behind the clouds something is going on. Like they, they miss that for, for over two months. Now, on, conversely, in the summer, they have 80 straight days without night, where it's just daylight for 80 straight days. But if you think that is something, 
Worse than that is I found a town in Norway. This part of Norway is in a similar sort of uh, latitude of, of, um, of Alaska, of Barrow, Alaska, but differently, they are nestled in the valley of mountains. And so even in for months when the sun comes up, they don't get any of the sunlight on them because it's the shadow of the mountains is on them. So for six months, they live in darkness. Like, that's time to move, I think. <laughs> in fact, they have, and this is what this picture, in order to counter this, they have actually set up a series of mirrors on the side of the mountain so that when the sun does begin to shine, it actually will reflect into the center of the town and the people can gather together and to enjoy a little bit of the sunlight. It's crazy, right? You see, Isaiah's whole vision here, what he projects to the people of Israel, what he's talking about hope begins with a description of transformation. Isaiah has been describing for the people their condition, the condition of, of the northern kingdom, what they have already experienced. Assyria has already come in and conquered the northern kingdom as a result of their sin and their idolatry. And he's speaking to the southern kingdom now, and he says, this is, this is what awaits us. This is what's coming to us for the same reason. But he says this darkness, this, this gloom, this despair that we are experiencing, it's not where God's going to leave us. Look, if you will, back in the verse that preceded. This is the, uh, chapter 8, the last verse in chapter 8, verse 22. Um, actually, I'll read that in the, in the beginning of 9 again. He says, then they will look toward the earth. And see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. And then they will thrust, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. Nevertheless, Isaiah says, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. And the people walking in darkness. They've seen a great light, and on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. So essentially, Isaiah is saying, look, our current reality is not going to be our future experience. We, we have to remember what brought Israel into this condition of distress and of darkness. Israel's leaders, their kings, have, have led the people away from the worship of Yahweh, their God, and into the worship of idols. Away from this covenant relationship that they had with their Savior and, and contracts, into contracts with surrounding kings and kingdoms and these attempts to preserve their own sense of power. In doing so, they have adopted the, the, the deities of these pagan nations around them. And so instead of trusting the covenant promise of their God, they have attempted to take matters into their own hands and the results now are, are, are catastrophic. Remember all the way back into 1 Samuel, when the people of Israel first come and, and talk to the prophet Samuel and say, we want to be like the other nations around us. We want a king who is going to, to lead us. And God at the time speaks to the people and says, I'm willing to give you this, but understand this is not going to go well for you. This doesn't end well for you. And now they're experiencing this very thing. But Isaiah says, in the midst of this, a light is dawning. I think it's worth noting here that, that, that I oftentimes look at what's unfolding in, in the Old Testament or sometimes in the story of the people of Israel and, and you can look and say, why are they doing this? Or you almost sort of this judgmental spirit about it. But this, this same condition of the heart, this is we do this. Where, where we seek to maintain our own sense of control and we seek to kind of compromise with the world around us in order to arrive at an outcome that we determine to be um, uh, valuable or worthwhile or attractive, right? This is exactly what the kings of Israel did. And the condition, the result of it is always the same. It always leads us to the same place. Essentially, it's this government that they asked for has led them into darkness. And now God's saying, Isaiah's saying, but he's not going to leave us there. In fact, what's, what's kind of incredible about this whole thing 
is that Isaiah is saying that the, the very scene of the defeat, the place where, where Assyria first came in and, and overtook the northern kingdom, he refers to those regions in verse 1 of Zebulon and Naphtali in the land of Galilee. Isaiah is saying this place where Assyria came in and conquered us as a people is also going to be the same place where God comes in, where the light breaks through. In fact, Matthew will quote, if you flip over to Matthew chapter 4, Matthew is describing the beginning of Jesus' ministry here. This is what he says. This is Matthew 4, beginning in verse 12. He says, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali, to fulfill what the prophet, what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulon and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light, and on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is is exactly where Jesus launched his ministry. This is where he began to proclaim for the first time the good news about the arrival of of God's kingdom. It was the scene of the defeat. So Isaiah is saying a light is dawning. And this this is more than wishful thinking or hoping for a better day. This is what Isaiah is describing is the return of God's presence with the people. And Matthew says it's happened. It's happened the way he said it would. It's happened where he said it would. And the person of Jesus. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And so Isaiah continues. And he highlights this this contrast between their current reality and and that of a new hope. The reality of of a new hope. We, we, We can all imagine or envision what it feels like to hope for something better. That this makes up the context, right, of every political speech we've ever heard. That, that what's going on currently and what's broken with it and why if we elect a certain person or a certain party or a certain whatever, that they're going to improve things. I, uh, uh, my family this week was filling out the um, brackets for the basketball tournament. We do like on both sides of my family, we do just kind of a family thing all the kids join in they all fill out their brackets and then it's just more or less for bragging rights to see who's the uh, luckiest of us all so my youngest daughter was filling out her her bracket and um and she was choosing wisconsin to go all the way which did not end well for her actually (laughs) they lost already but um but i so i was kind of just curious because and she she kept saying wisconsin and she goes i'm going to live there someday and i was like oh uh, why are you, what, what's the plan there? And she goes, lower taxes. <laughs> I was like, how do you know that? Like, what? Like, it was just like hilarious. Like this, this, this vision that she had for a better future. We, we do this all the time. Imagine, imagine for a moment being the people who are hearing Isaiah speak these words. Imagine hearing this for the first time when all you see around you is corruption and brokenness, oppression from your own government, and then on top of that, you have this brutal nation that's coming in to enact God's justice, who's even more corrupt and more oppressive, who's going to take your land and send your people into exile, and then Isaiah begins to speak and describe something entirely different. I would guess that for the people hearing this for the very first time, this would have been difficult to believe, difficult to wrap their heads around. Again, this is um, back in, in, in Isaiah verses three through five. Listen to what Isaiah describes to the people. He says, you've enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harbor, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning and will be fuel for the fire. Isaiah describes this 
this contrasting vision of what Israel will experience. And there's a couple things he begins. He, he, I don't know if he caught this or not, but he references in there in verse four, this, he says something about Midian's defeat, which I don't want to make too much of this, but, but it's this reference back to Judges chapter seven, where the, the uh, judge Gideon is leading the people of Israel against the, the armies of Midian. And they've got 30,000 people gathered together. And, and God says, I, I don't want to do this with 30,000. And, and it, long story short, he reduces Israel's manpower to 300 people. And then there's a reference in there. And he says, I've done this so that, that they will know who won the victory. So that the people will understand that this is something God did. This wasn't, this isn't electing the right guy. This isn't, this isn't getting the right party in power. This is something only God could accomplish. And so he says he's going to, to enlarge the nation. When the Messiah comes to save Israel, when he comes to accomplish this, it won't just be for the Jewish people, but he's going to expand the invitation to who this includes. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10, it describes the messianic kingdom, the messianic rule in this new Jerusalem. And it says in verse 10 that he will, all the nations will rally to him. He, he, he's including us in under this, this rule and reign of justice and freedom that he's bringing. He says he's going to increase their joy. This is, this is a point of emphasis for Isaiah. In fact, he talks about the idea of joy, increasing joy over two dozen times throughout this book. And he's talking about more than the condition of, of being happy. What Isaiah is describing for the people is a state of being that is a result of his reign, his government. It's the awareness of his control and it's, it's the submission under his sovereignty. And he's saying that Messiah, when Messiah comes, that we will experience this in even greater measure in their lives. He says that they will break the yoke that burdens, the bar across their shoulders. Jesus would say it this way in the, in, in the book of Matthew. He says, come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble, and you will find rest in your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Isaiah describes justice and freedom from oppression and peace. And he says, this is what it will be like when the Messiah comes, when Jesus institutes his kingdom. He describes a, a new hope based on what God promises he will accomplish. See, oftentimes when we read this, and maybe you feel this even now, that there's this disconnect between what Isaiah promised and, and what we have experienced post the arrival of Jesus. We can look around and, and we can find plenty of oppression and plenty of injustice and, and plenty of uh, anything but a, a experience of peace. So we say, where is this real? Where is this true? Where is all of this happening? And what Isaiah is giving us here is this window into the kingdom of God. It's what Jesus taught us and what he offers us. It's what we experience when his rule and reign takes place collectively here in our hearts, right? It's what we experience, what it should be the experience collectively when the body of Christ gathers together in this thing called his church. This should be what Isaiah is describing here should be increasingly true of us when we live under his kingdom rule and reign. And see, so we're not just the, the recipients, the benefactors of what Isaiah is describing. We, we, as the church, we become agents of it. Now, it's absolutely true that we don't always experience this. We don't always um, um, represent this kingdom well. Um, we still fail to continue to live under this, this authority. And when we do, we... We oppress each other in, in small ways and large ways. We, we experience a lack of peace, but we continue to pray that Jesus, the way Jesus taught us to pray, that his kingdom would come and that his will would be done, that it would be increasingly the reality here. 
We continue to pray that, that just as he taught us that we would seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things, Jesus said, will be added unto us. So in a vision such as this, a, a hope cast such as this, if you're hearing Isaiah describe this for the very first time, the question that you have to ask is how? How is God going to accomplish all of this? And this is where Isaiah so poetically and beautifully says, a son is given. A child will be born, a son is given. Verses six and seven, again, these familiar verses. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. See, this, this part of Isaiah 9 is, is typically what we are familiar with because we read it so frequently around Christmas. When we see the, the work that God has promised to accomplish on behalf of his people and on behalf of all of us, we understand that the only way for Isaiah's words to be anything more than wishful thinking is, is for God to send himself. For him to enter into the brokenness, the only way for, for light to overcome the darkness is for the light to enter the darkness. Think back to that image from Norway for a moment. That, that's what struck me so profoundly about what they seek to accomplish here and what we're talking about in Isaiah 9. Because they understood that in order to overcome their problem, they had to find a way for the light to break in. And this is what Isaiah is depicting to the people of Israel. This is what was promised for them. This is what he would accomplish, that the light would break in. See, the value of a promise is, is only worth the capacity of the one who makes it. And this is, what, this is exactly what God intends to do. He says, a child will be born. A son will be given and the government will be on his shoulders. And we're going to call him Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God and Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He says there's going to be no end to his rule. He's going to establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness because he is the one who is just and righteous. You see, the, the child, the son, contains the very character of God. He is God because it requires nothing less than God himself to do what he said he'll do. See, the challenge for us as we live this out in the day and age and the experience of the church and the world that we live in is that we sometimes want to settle for something less. And Isaiah's depiction of the Messiah, of this government that he will establish, reminds us that the best possible option for us, the best possible thing for his church is when we submit to his rule and reign because what he began to bring was, was justice, was righteousness, was his peace. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together in your name and to be reminded of, of what you would accomplish. We, we thank you that we can once again go to the other side of the story and look forward. Lord, shape and, and help us to understand more fully who you are. And God, to submit ourselves to, to your kingdom, to your rule and reign in our lives so that we might experience exactly what you promised to bring. And we pray that we would be the agents of this in the world around us. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.